Jacob was brought to Auschwitz on May 27, 1944. She was 18 years old and was the eve of Shavuot, the Jewish holiday which celebrates the giving of Torah on Mount Sinai. Lily arrived at the death camp along with the rest of her Hungarian family and neighbors. They were from the small town of Bilk in the Carpathian Mountains. Weeks prior to the transport to Auschwitz, they had been rounded up outside their local synagogue and crammed into an overcrowded ghetto. It took four transport forts by rail to bring 10,000 men, women, and children from the ghetto to the concentration camp. As the Nazis tried to celebrate the final solution, they moved systematically through German-occupied Europe, transporting Jews to death camps. The more German troops lost on the battlefield, the more resources and manpower Hitler poured into the mechanizations of the concentration camps. By 1944, the train tracks of Auschwitz were extended, so they fed right into the camp. The SS had orders to process 400,000 Hungarian Jews in two months. When Lily deboarded the boxcar that spring day, she was separated from her family almost immediately. In the selection process, Lily was deemed fit for work by the doctors and wardens of the SS. Her grandparents and parents were considered unfit to work because they were either too old or too young. Really consisting of 40 concentration camps, Auschwitz-Birkenau was the largest death camp in Nazi-occupied Europe. One million people were killed there as part of the Nazis' final solution, which would eventually wipe out two-thirds of all European Jewry. By the time the Soviet soldiers arrived at Auschwitz on January 27, 1945, only 7,000 prisoners remained. All the rest had been taken out on a death march or evacuated to smaller concentration camps farther away from the Red Army's advance. Lily was transported to the Dora concentration camp in Germany, 400 miles from Auschwitz. By the time the camp was liberated by U.S. troops, Lily was sick, as were several hundred other prisoners, in addition to over a thousand corpses. Lily was placed in an abandoned SS barracks to recover from typhus. One day during her recovery, she rummaged through a cabinet looking for a blanket. She found a Nazi officer's coat and put it on. Inside the pocket was a small beige photo album. The album was 56 pages and had almost 200 photographs. She began to flip through the photos and realized that they were documentation of the very day her community arrived at Auschwitz. She saw pictures of her grandparents, the rabbi, and her brothers. She even recognized herself among a group of shaven women. There are many miracle stories that come from the Holocaust, but this one is too impossible to just be a mere coincidence. A million Jews deported at Auschwitz. The pictures in the album were from one or two train arrivals. And Lily was not even at Auschwitz when she found the album. She was 400 miles away in a different camp. Her survival would have been a miracle enough, but finding this album, giving her photos of her forever lost family, that is the story outline that bears divine thumbprints. Eventually, after the war, Lily got married and managed to move to America. She made no secret about the album. She received calls every week from people who wanted to know if they could find photos of their own family members in the album. On rare occasions when a family member could be matched with a photo, Lily gave the picture to them knowing how much the photos of her brothers and grandparents meant to her. The album also served as evidence in Nazi war trials. During the Frankfurt Auschwitz trials in the 1960s, the album was used as evidence along with Lily's testimony and that of 180 more survivors to incriminate Nazi officials of mass murder. In the 1980s, the famous Nazi hunter Sergei Klarsfield convinced Lily that the album would best be preserved at Yad Vashem, the World Holocaust Remembrance Center located in Jerusalem. Yad Vashem restored the album in their conservation laboratory, scanned and digitized the images to get high resolution photos. And they even matched the photos with aerial photos of Auschwitz taken by the US Air Force in 44 and 1945. Most importantly, they set to the task of identifying all the individuals in the photos. 
Today, almost 75% of the faces in the album have been identified, a remarkable accomplishment considering the numbers of those who were exterminated soon after their arrival. The album contains photographs taken by a Nazi guard at Auschwitz. Historians believe the guard's name was either Ernest Hoffman or Bernard Walter. They were the two SS men who took ID photos of the incoming prisoners. Also, no one knows the purpose of the album. It was clearly not for propaganda or a personal keepsake. The architects of the final solution were incredibly careful to keep the death camps a secret. This album is the only surviving photographic evidence of the extermination process from inside a concentration camp. The only other pictures taken inside Auschwitz were four blurry photos of the gas chambers taken by a prisoner with a hidden camera and smuggled out to the Polish resistance. The pictures in the Auschwitz album, however, are taken by a trained photographer. They're organized into 11 sections that each represent the steps in the Nazi selection process from the arrival and dressing and gassing processes. The only thing not photographed is the killing itself. While some Holocaust historians think all the pictures were taken in one day, other analysts believe it represents seven different transports and the pictures are curated to show only a well-run process as required by the Nazi authorities. Either way, the importance of the album cannot be overstated. What is known from many a memoir by Holocaust survivors is displayed in the same way in those black and white photographs. Hitler industrialized evil to a degree never witnessed before. The album's photographs are vivid images of mothers, fathers, and children. In their eyes, you can see the shame of being shaved and deloused to the exhausted shoulders of grandparents who survived the grueling cattle car rides. Their sleeves are branded with yellow stars and many of them carry parcels of food or bedding. Some pictures show them deboarding the trains and others they are lined up for registration and they are sorted into fit to work and unfit to work. Pat Mercer Hutchins is my former colleague at the Jerusalem Connection. I worked with Pat for many years before she died in 2014 from ovarian cancer. I still work with her husband of 55 years, Jim Hutchins. He was the president of Jerusalem Connection before he retired at 82, and I've been trying to fill his big shoes ever since. Not an easy task considering he was an army chaplain and major general with a purple heart for his acts of courage in Vietnam. Pat Hutchins was a well-known artist in Northern Virginia. She taught art classes to senators and Congress people on the Hill in DC. She was actively involved with our work at Jerusalem Connection and advocating for Israel and the Jewish people. She has her P she got her PhD in biblical studies and she authored two books. She was the kind of woman who lived 10 lives in one. When Yad Vashem first digitized and shared the Auschwitz album online so that anyone in the world could see the photos up close themselves, Patty was eager to study images and commentary. However, she found herself unable to look away from the faces of the men, women, and children and the last moments captured in the photos. She started to have nightmares. She told me many times that in her dreams, she was wandering through the concentration camps with children dying all around her. She tried to resuscitate one child after another, but nothing she did brought them back to life. When she awoke, she felt compelled to paint. Only through art did she feel like in some form she could give the victims life again, preserve their memory and mark their last breaths. First, she painted from one of the Auschwitz album photos, which showed a woman holding a child sitting in a grove with many others, both declared unfit for work. Pat titled this painting, Slaughter of the Innocents. From the pictures, the people waiting in the groves of birch trees do not seem to comprehend that they are about to be killed. They were lied to every step of the way, told that they would be showered and changed and then reunited with their families. They hung their clothes on numbered hooks. And they were given a sense of order and an impression that they would need to refine their things after the shower. When the doors were locked, a cyanide-based pesticide dropped down from above. Some died within two minutes. Witnesses tell of hearing screams for up to 20 minutes before everyone died. In one photo, two wealthy appearing women in fur coats stand out among the other community members in the grove. 
They appear to be looking off into the distance towards the crematorium. Concern is registered in the eyes of all, but the youngest children. In many of the paintings, as in the photographs, smoke from the crematorium is seen rising in the background. The rising smoke is subtle in the black and white images, but Pat took artistic liberty and dramatized the smoke and pillars for the hell that we know was behind that smoke. There's nothing subtle about that smoke. Pat did not know how many paintings she would do at first, but she set a goal of 12. As a mother and grandmother, it was the images of mothers holding babies that struck her first and came most naturally to paint. In two of her paintings, there are mothers whose faces cannot be seen, but the small children almost look directly into the camera. One of the mothers holds a child with a bunched, stylish hat, and the other baby girl's hat covers her ears. Both mothers stood near the trains, apparently just having deboarded. Certainly the exhausted mothers have been holding their children throughout the train ride. Their faces can't be seen, but one can only imagine the fatigue in their arms. Pat looked at the sleeves of the one child and could relate to the mother's desire to keep her child's ungloved hands warm by tugging at her jacket sleeves. She titled this one, Little Pink Rose of Hungry, and the other is titled, Why Me, Mommy? They both represent the hundreds of thousands of small children who were murdered immediately upon arriving at Auschwitz. As Hitler's plan accelerated, many children were thrown clothes and all into the fire pits. The prophet Jeremiah speaks of a voice heard in Ramah, lamentations and bitter weeping, Rachel weeping for her children, refusing to be comforted because they were no more. did focused in on a little girl in a bonnet, eating a snack which was surely packed and rationed by her mother. Next to her is her brother who looks down instead of at the Nazi officer holding the camera. The danger of looking any SS in the eyes was surely already drilled into the boy by that point. Pat titled this one Sophie's Choice, a nod to the book and film which portray the complete lack of choice during those dark days. As she painted, Pat was diagnosed with cancer. She endured three grueling years of chemotherapy and throughout it all, she continued to paint. She painted the women who were selected as fit to work. The fit to work selectees went into real showers and they were forced to change into sack dresses and old shoes. No undergarments were given. What they brought with them was taken and heaped into huge piles and they were forcefully separated from their husbands, fathers and younger children. The women were deloused with lime poured over their bodies and their hair was crudely chopped. Gold dental fillings were extracted. Just as Pat was losing her own hair during chemotherapy, she painted these newly shaven women. In the photos, like the paintings, the women hang their heads in shame or stare in shock. It is certain that their torment and shame will be exposed to even lower evils in their time at the concentration camp. One of the women is visibly pregnant.
Pat also was certain to pay tribute to Lily Jacob, the survivor who first found the album in the pocket of the Nazi uniform jacket. The picture of Lily's handsome brothers has been in many books and films and is the most recognizable of all the photos. It is now in turn one of the most requested of Pat's paintings for exhibits and reprints. Had Lily not donated the album to Yad Vashem, it would not have had the chance to be shared so widely, giving Pat the chance to study them so close. When Lily first opened her album alone in the abandoned SS barracks, the first face that she recognized was Rabbi Naftali Weiss, her own rabbi, the chief rabbi of Bilt, her hometown. He's the rabbi on the left in the picture. A recognized spiritual leader of Zion would soon endure his own humiliation, the shaving of his beard and side curls and removal of his head covering. To display his horror and inner spiritual rebellion against this darkness, Pat painted the yellow star on the rabbi's jacket to appear as though it is cringing. spent her last years commemorating the memory of victims of Auschwitz by painting them on canvas. There were times that she painted on her hands and knees so weakened and nauseated by the treatments. Every time she thought she was done, she would feel compelled to paint one more. She called the, the collection the Auschwitz Album Revisited. In total, the series includes 40 oil paintings, a remarkable achievement. Jem Hutchins, Pat's husband and the founder of Jerusalem Connection donated the originals of Pat's paintings to Liberty University in Virginia so that the Holocaust can continue to be brought before the next generation. Working together with Liberty and Yad Vashem with the encouragement of Pat's children and now Skywatch, I wanted to make a booklet that brought both Pat's paintings and the original photos together. Because I love the Jewish people and I loved Pat, I wanted to share this amazing work of art and memory. I want to thank the Christian Friends of Yad Vashem for giving Jerusalem Connection the opportunity to use high-resolution copies of the original photographs that are safeguarded in the Yad Vashem archives. The photos in the Auschwitz album reveal the Nazi tactics of dehumanization, meant to make it harder to see each person as a suffering individual. Pat's purpose in painting the victims was to zoom in, take two, three, or four individuals from the larger group photos and search for their more personal story. It was her prayer that observers would think about each man, woman, and child pictured in the album separately. That is certainly what she did in the process of creating the art. In one photo, an older man stood all by himself. His hand was slightly obscured in the photograph. So Pat asked her husband, Jim, to model his hand. In another photograph, a middle-aged woman in black held her shawl tight around her chin and Pat used her own strong Irish hand as a model. She said she wanted to symbolically give a sister in death a hand which she could not give her in life. For those who knew Pat during those years of painting the album, it was a heart-wrenching process but she knew that she had to create a monument of remembrance to these precious lives lost, and she had to do it through art, the medium God gave her. In January 2011, Regent University Library hosted the world premiere of the Auschwitz album we visited. Later the same year, through the efforts of Pat's close friends and fellow artists, Michael and Ina Rigacci, the paintings were brought to the Krakow Jewish Cultural Festival in Poland. Chiclets of the Auschwitz album revisited are now part of the permanent collection at the Jewish Community Center at Auschwitz. In 2014, the Rogachis also curated the Chiclets to become part of the permanent exhibition at the Holocaust Museum in Ukraine. The original paintings of the Auschwitz album revisited are now a permanent part of Liberty University's art collection. One of the survivors from Auschwitz who have, I have had the honor to meet is Irene Weiss. Irene lives in Virginia, not far from Pat Hutchins' home. She heard about the series of paintings and it was arranged for her to come see the paintings at Pat's home. 
One of the Auschwitz album photos is a family sitting in the birch groves. It was the very last moments of, her, of life for Irene's mother and her two brothers. They were likely told to wait in the grove and have a rest before further instructions. Even though Irene was only 13, she looked older, and so she was sent to work as a slave laborer with her sister in Auschwitz. Irene survived the war when Auschwitz Birkenau was liberated. Pat presented the painting of Irene's family to her in person in 2013. Last year, I was living in the same county in Virginia as Irene, and when my eighth grade son came home telling me they were learning about the Holocaust at school in English class, I contacted the teacher to see if she'd be interested in having her students learn from a survivor. She jumped at the chance. What resulted was an assembly of hundreds of students meeting together in a high school theater. At 88 years old, Irene had not forgotten her story or the story of her family. The high schoolers hung on her every word. She told them how at exactly their age she arrived at the camp, and when she asked other prisoners how she could find her family, a woman pointed to the chimney and said, see that smoke? There's your family. I sat in the back and listened to their questions as they tried to make sense of something so senseless. They tried to gain the lessons without the tragedy and they sought to glean wisdom from this woman's triumph. Today, there are those who brazenly claim, despite the Auschwitz album and other historical, irrefutable evidence, that the Holocaust is a myth or a lie. Those of us who are still alive must speak for the ones who cannot. Anti-Semitism is again rearing its ugly head worldwide. Once more, Jews are the target of choice to blame for the world's problems, whether it's the global pandemic or the racial protest. The chapter of evil in the world is not over, it must actively be fought against still. And one way of continuing that fight is remembering. Remembering is resistance.